Okay, hey everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk today on rapidly scaling for breaking news with Carpenter and Kata. My name is Mel Cohn. I use any pronouns. I'm a senior software engineer at the New York Times in delivery engineering, which is a platform team that is building the shared platform in the New York Times. And I'm specifically on the team that manages and maintains and adds features to our shared Kubernetes clusters in AWS. Hi, everyone. My name's Deepak. I'm also, my pronouns are he, him. I'm also on the same team. Is that better? I'm also on the same team as Mel, working on the same shared platform. Get right into it. So what's a breaking news alert? So a breaking news alert is a push notification that we send our users. And I'm sure you've gotten some of these or might even get one, get one during the talk. But as you expect, this leads to a sudden influx of traffic of people to the website and the mobile app. And this leads to some interesting traffic patterns. We see sudden spiky traffic, and this is an example of an average traffic spike, usually caused by a push notification. We regularly see traffic spike to two to three X, and this happens within a minute. In the past, we've over-provisioned to deal with this, but that costs a lot of money, and we want to minimize the amount of infrastructure that we're using. So we want to need a way to scale down and scale up quickly. This is another example of a traffic pattern that we see. This is a result of a daily release of a game, and this also leads to about a 3x increase in traffic in a very short time span. This traffic is regular, so we, can, we know when to expect this, and we know how long it lasts. So we can, we, we can also scale, predictably scale for this. So now Mel will dive deeper into our architecture and what we're scaling. OK, so why do we see this traffic spike? The New York Times has a unified HTTP ingress. This is a relatively recent thing that handles some of our internal and external traffic. It's, the goal is to have everything eventually pass through the ingress, but the ingress controller needs to scale to handle the traffic spikes from the BNAs and games. So we often see the 3x increase in terms of 3x number of replicas of the unified HTTP ingress, and this is running on the Kubernetes clusters. So when a user opens the New York Times website or app, the request is routed through our HTTP ingress. The ingress sends the request to the corresponding upstream for the appropriate services. That said, these services often need to make calls to other New York Times services behind our ingress. For example, the front page service will make a call to our auth service to check if the user is logged in and has a subscription, or a call to our personalization service, which customizes the organization of stories presented to a user. And then those services need to make calls back to the front page, front page service. This means that there's a spike in user traffic, but there's also a spike in internal traffic, which makes the traffic spike for Ingress even bigger. So in this diagram, this is a portion of our shared platform, specifically the shared Kubernetes clusters in AWS. We run a multi-tenant Kubernetes runtime with clusters in multiple regions and environments, including a sandbox cluster we use for testing changes, and teams are we're provided with a tenant cloud account along with access to a team namespace in the cluster in the dev stage and prod clusters. So we, whenever we need to scale, we need to scale across multiple clusters. Obviously prod is a bigger scale, but it's all of them. So now we'll talk about how we're scaling with Carpenter and how we're scaling our nodes. So why wouldn't we just use autoscaler? So first, Carpenter is a native Kubernetes autoscaler, so it's installed as a CRD and we're already using a Kubernetes-based workflow for installing our other parts of our cluster. So we're able to configure Carpenter via YAML as part of this workflow. With Autoscaler, we'd had a lot of Terraform that had to be run separately to be installed on each of our environments. So, and that had to be maintained separately. Now I'm gonna hand it back to Mel to talk further about Carpenter. Yeah, so Carpenter is able to scale at the pod level by finding the optimal way to pack pods into nodes using a bin packing algorithm. While the cluster autoscaler is more naive in its approach, it, it scales at the node level based on overall resource demand. So for example, if you have resource limits on a pod and you need to increase the number, number of replicas, it looks at the resource limits for that pods and sees where it can schedule it. There's a bit of an algorithm there, but it's more naive. Um, and then, Carpenter also takes into consideration all instance types that meet the requirements you specify. So we're gonna show an example in a minute, but you can give multiple instance types as options, which is what really gets a lot of the power of Carpenter because Carp Carpenter has multiple algorithms that are like optimizing from a cost perspective, which thing to spin up. So if you look at the diagram, in Carpenter, if you have pending Kubernetes pods, 
if they can be fit on an existing node, they go ahead and get scheduled by the scheduler. If they're not, then Carpenter will spin up a new node. That said, Carpenter will do node consolidation. And so if it realizes, okay, I can get a bigger node that's cheaper than the total cost of the other nodes, then it will spin up that node and move things over there. So Carpenter uses groupless autoscaling. So the migration was a little complicated. We went from managed node groups to this groupless autoscaling that leverages uh, the security groups and uh, security groups and the subnets, it adds a tag so that it knows where to spin stuff up. Um, but it's groupless because of the different instance types. Uh, and it can't be used with a cluster autoscaler. They explicitly say not to. So provisioners, which now as of very recently are with Carpenter graduating to beta like a week and a half ago, are being renamed to uh, node pools, which that's gonna be fun when we upgrade. Um, <laughs> And they're the equivalent of a node group in EKS. So this example right here is one of the provisioners that we use in our cluster specifically for tenants. So we have a bit more flexibility here than say the provisioner for our unified HTTP ingress. And you can see you have the different instance types and you have the, um, the part for Celium, specifically like the startup taint. And then you can, we also have our nodes expire every 14 days. Part of the reason is spot instances can't be replaced and like changed to a different size. They're just deleted. And so we want to cycle the nodes. And then it's also like fun, you know, chaos engineering to have our nodes cycle every 14 days. And it's at max 14 days. Sometimes they go away sooner than that. Um, and then we have consolidation enabled, which you don't have to do. And I'll go into a bit more, but we don't do that for our unified HTTP ingress. Uh, so consolidation. So this is kind of like the big way that we save money. So Carpenter has three ways to consolidate nodes. It reduces the cost by either deleting or replacing the nodes, either if they're empty, if their workloads can run on other nodes, or if they can be replaced with cheaper nodes. And by cheaper, I, it could possibly mean one node replacing multiple nodes or one node replacing one node. So in order, it goes through and it sees, can it delete any empty nodes? Or it tries to delete multiple nodes and launch a cheaper single node, or it deletes a single node and then tries and replace with a cheaper node. On the right hand side, this is something taken from the Carpenter docs. I took a portion of it. This is actually the node pool, which has all these new uh, pieces in the spec and everything too. Um, but it allows you to define how disruption works. So you have this consolidation policy, either you say when underutilized or when empty, and then you say how long it will wait before it makes a decision. And then you can also set it to expire after a certain amount of time, which is the same thing that you saw on the previous slide with the provisioner that we had the 14 days. Okay, so this is code taken from the Carpenter GitHub repository. I'm not gonna walk through like every line, just the high level. So this is the cool part with spot instances. So part of the reason we migrated to Carpenter, it was a lot easier to do spot instances there than it was to do with our managed node groups. And we really wanted to use spot instances. And so this filter unwanted spot, what it does is it filters out spot types that are more expensive than the cheapest on-demand type that we could launch. So if the on-demand type is going to be just as the same price or like cheaper, then it doesn't make sense to do a spot instance. We also, for anyone who doesn't know a lot about spot instances, you essentially can like bid on them. And so people could like outbid you. We don't bid. And so it's kind of like naive even how we do it. So it's either it's cheaper, or it's not the end. Um, and it also is gonna find like the cheapest offering for the spot instances from the options that you give it. So if you don't give it as many options, you're not gonna have as big of a like, bang for your buck because it doesn't have as many options to choose from. And that also makes consolidation harder if you don't have as many options to choose from. Uh. Cool, so now we have a quick demo on how Carpenter works. It should autoplay and I can't see it on my laptop so <laughs> I'll explain it from here. But on the left side, we just have a quick HTTP bin deployment that I'll be scaling up and on the right side, just tailing some logs from the Carpenter controller so we can see what Carpenter is doing. 
So right now, you can see that Carpenter has, might be a little small, but Carpenter has some spot instance pricing that it's aware of. It's aware of what instances it, it can pick from when scaling. And on the left side, just scaling up, say we have a breaking news event, something big, scaling up to 500 deploy, uh, replicas. And we're going to watch that scale up. And on the right side, once, once the pods scale up and Carpenter's aware, you should be able to see that Carpenter will decide first what node, which go through the algorithm, see which node, pick an instance type, and see which it can provision. And we should see on the right side. Yeah, so now we can see that Carpenter has decided to provision a new node. It picked a specific instance type. And on the left side, we can see now that the node is there. And we can also see, and we can see that it's actually provisioning a second node also to meet the demand to schedule all the pods. And then if you look at the tags on the, on the node, we can see that Carpenter picked a certain instance type and it's tagged by Carpenter. And now the important part is that we want to be able to also scale down if we scale up. So I'm going to try scaling down on the left and scaling back down to one. So yeah, now we're scaling down. One second. Yeah, this part I was trying to see if there was pods in the node, but command didn't work, but yep. <laughs> waiting for the node to be ready. But yeah, just waiting for the, waiting for me to scale it down. Sorry we didn't do a live demo. We didn't <laughs> want to test yeah, the, the demo gobs, but this was recorded yesterday. <laughs> I'm close enough to live. <laughs> mm. So yeah, now we can see that the, this is me showing that the pods are, have been scheduled on that node that was provisioned. And, and part of what you're saying is it takes a little bit for it to decide to disrupt the node and get rid of it. Yeah. Um, it needs to like move around the pods and then also get rid of all the daemon set pods. Yep, and now we're scaling it down to one and then we can see that the deployment has now is one replica. So. So we should see that Carpenter is not going to go through that consolidation algorithm where it's going to either delete the node or try to replace with a single node. But in this case, it's likely just going to delete both nodes since we've scaled down from 500 pods into one pod. So on the right side, soon we'll see the Carpenter is going to decide to delete each of those nodes that it's created, and we'll be back to our original state very quickly. Part of the other reason we decided to use Carpenter was also it's faster than the cluster autoscaler. So we did like some benchmarking and I want to say cluster autoscaler maybe takes like two minutes and Carpenter is like 90 seconds, sometimes even 60 seconds, a little longer to schedule something on it. And that sounds like not a lot, but when you have the traffic spikes we have, that is a lot and also is still not really enough. Um, so, yeah. Cool. That's the demo. Now we'll talk about more of it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and now we'll talk more about how we're scaling with Kata. So just to give an overview of Kata, Kata is an event-based scaler, and, and it extends the, the HPA. So it configures the HPA for your deployment instead of, it doesn't replace the HPA. So scaling is set up via, via a scaled object, and the scaled object defines which deployment is the target and then it also defined what the trigger is. So trigger could be a bunch of event sources that Kata provides out of the box. So let's revisit some of those traffic spikes. So this is the, this is the release traffic spike, the predictable traffic spike. So we needed a way to make sure we can scale up in time, and we know when these spikes are. So we were able to use Kata's cron event type to scale our ingress controller. So essentially, we specify, specify time for it to scale up to a certain replica amount and then Kata patches the HPA to scale it up for this time period. And this would have been very doable with the Kubernetes cron job also, but Kata allows us to define our scaling logic in one YAML, and it also modifies the replicas for us. So this is just a diagram combining Carpenter and Kata and how we scale together. So when a, when a, 
when a drop happens, or at least happens, we can see that Keda first adjusts our ingress controller replica. So it modifies the HPA, which killed up to deployment. And then Carpenter, in response, has to be able to schedule all of these pods that have been, that have been created. So Carpenter adjusts the node pool that manages the ingress controller and then optimizes for cost by picking the best in instance. And once the Keda cron event ends, we know that Car Car Keda will scale down the deployment and in response, Carpenter will either delete the nodes or replace the nodes with cheaper nodes. And we've also explored other ways to scale. So this is the revisiting the breaking news alert. So we know when we're gonna send a breaking news alert, so we need a way to like scale in, in response to this event. But we, these aren't predictable. We don't know like it's gonna happen at the same time every day. So these spikes are more random and more frequent, so we can't use the cron solution. So Keda supports an external push trigger. So we essentially set up the server ourselves to s send an alert to Keda. So as you can see in this diagram, we have, we first have like the breaking news alert going out after the article is published. And then the webhook server that, that the team that sends out the notification sends an alert to. And then in order to set up the external server, we have to set up, we, there needs to be a gRPC server that Keda listens to. So that's where the external push goes. So the, the request gets sent to the server, webhook server, which gets sent to the gRP server. And then once it hits the gRP server, Keda knows to scale up. And it would be a similar type of solution where Keda would scale up to an X amount once it receives that alert that a breaking news alert has gone out. And now we're gonna discuss some lessons learned from this process. So cost savings. Um, we were looking to save money by not over-provisioning as much. So this is really hard given the way that the breaking news alerts work and what Deepak was talking about with like getting a heads up. The heads up is like a couple seconds. And when your spike happens in like 20 to 40 seconds and lasts for only two and a half minutes and is so huge and it basically means that like by the time you scale up, you have to scale down. Um, so, you know, over provisioning was kind of what we were able to do, and um, to be honest, we still do it somewhat, um, but a lot less now. And a lot of that is to do with the cron job that he mentioned, but also the things in Carpenter. So there's a node consolidation, so that means less over-provisioning, right, because it's gonna pick like the cheaper nodes. It's important that we have like a variety of nodes that it can pick from, otherwise, like if you say, okay, you can only do this specific instance type, then it can't do anything. It's either like, okay, it's spot or it's on demand, the end. And we do have some provisioners that are only on demand because they're like more critical workloads. Um, yeah, and so with the cron job, we don't need to over provision things as much and can adjust the scaled object max replicas based on observed traffic patterns. So for example, um, recently with some of the releases of the newer games, there has been like a record number of downloads of games. And so it was like, huh, I wonder what's going, oh, okay, cool. Um, so because we scale up ahead of time, we also have fewer alerts and things breaking in the cluster since it's not attempting to scale on the fly. And we also have more instance types to choose from. So with the managed node group, you have like an instance type. With Carpenter, you can give a set of instance types. So further improvements. Oh, and I forgot to mention, we saw a 25% decrease, 25 decrease in cost, which is exciting. Um, further improvements. So. Our unified HTTP ingress, because of how important it is, and because of like the networking and compute needs, has one instance type that it can do, and also we only do on-demand, so obviously we can't really leverage Carpenter for that, and also we don't do node consolidation for it. So we're already looking into ways that we can either like have more options for nodes, or maybe like switch from like a network optimized instance type to a compute optimized instance type, and just like really do more investigation into that. And reminder that this unified HTTP ingress is like maybe a year old, year and a half. So like, yeah. Um, and then we also, the external BNA scaler, we're trying to figure out like how to do that because of the little bit of heads up. That does, it's not really worth it to like implement a whole scaler when it's not, even a little less over provisioning would be good, but it's not worth it given the like little bit of heads up. And the way that the workflow works is it's kind of like unexpected. There's a whole process of getting an article approved. And I think it's like in Slack, they post like, hey, please give us a breaking news alert now. And it's like, there are other teams that are doing different things. And so by the time it gets to us, it's like, um, and then we also want to have 
potentially CADA as a service for tenants. So right now we have CADA rolled out to the tenants in our clusters, um, but we don't really have many who are using it. And I think part of the reason is because they don't know necessarily how or why. Um, I know Deepak said that we they have different metrics that you can scale on. So there's a lot of stuff built in. So Datadog, all the different clouds, like CPU, pretty much anything you can imagine. And like we said, you can write your own. Um, so ideally, we'd have something like in the shared platform where it's like, hey, do you want a scaler for this deployment? And like, give us a bit of the configuration and then we'll do it for you. So with Kata and Carpenter together, we were able to save significant money and um, our lives are a lot easier too. get paged way less often. Okay. So the other big thing is the shared platform. So shared platform is centralization and standardization, right? So before the shared platform, people were running and managing their own infrastructure. Understandably, there's gonna be differences in that infrastructure, not only because of the needs of the team, but also because of the expertise and what the team prefers. Um, but now that we have a lot of our services on the shared platform and specifically the shared cluster, we're able to establish a baseline and more easily compare across services and then detect outliers. So for example, we can ask questions like, why does this one service have significantly higher RPS? Sometimes the answer is the scale is larger and that's fine. Um, but other times it may be because there's like not an optimal traffic flow and something needs to be changed. Like maybe it's making too many, too many requests, maybe it's not caching, whatever. Your notes are cut off from the bottom, so I guess I'm just gonna wing this. Um, <laughs> um, so I already said some tenants make significantly more requests. I talked about earlier this kind of like you have to make calls to other services within the New York Times and then they make calls back and how that contributes to the spike. Um, but there are some that are making more requests than others and it's, we haven't like fully figured out what's going on, but it's a lot easier to tell. Um, and also with there being us scaling the architecture rather than the tenants needing to. And like I said, this like standardization, we have a much better idea like, okay, this is potentially something with the cluster versus this is something going on with the tenants, like this is expected behavior, all of that. Um, and then it also means they don't have to worry about it. So in the past, a lot of different teams scaled up for these breaking news alerts or for the games release because like, for example, like off or, uh, I, there, I gotta be careful. Off or say like personalization or algorithms, stuff like that. Uh, and now they don't need to do that anymore. I think we mentioned early on that not all of our services are even behind the ingress, which you don't have to be running your service in our shared cluster to be behind the ingress. You can be elsewhere. Um, so we're hoping that the more people that move to the platform, that that means it'll be easier to see some of these outliers and then it'll be good for everyone. They can go back, we can go back to the team, we can advise them as SMEs and say like, hey, we're seeing this, can you tell us why this might be happening? Can we help you improve your service? Okay, um, so with that, thank you very much. Um, we had a couple talks earlier this week from other of our coworkers. They already happened, but one at ArgoCon and one at MultitenancyCon. I encourage you all to check it out if you get the chance. Thank you, everyone. Very, very good talk. One of the best talk of the whole KubeCon, seriously. It's the last day, the last talk, and like it's full. Appreciate it's it. It's also both of our so, first talks at KubeCon. Uh, so. <laughs> so, still, I have a question. Um, so, you, you're using Kida, it's scaling the number of, it's using the HP to scale, let's say, 500 pods. Some of them are going to be scheduled because you already have the nodes, but then Carpenter is going to create new nodes. It can take some time. So do you have any way to kind of, or how do you manage to have some resources, like when Car Carpenter scale down the number of nodes, you still have some, some balloon, you can, you can schedule pods directly. Say that last part again. The last <laughs> part of it. You were like, how do you manage so, to blah? Uh, 
how do you manage to the the the, the number of nodes or the compute power you still have when yep. Carpenter moves down so you can accommodate at least some of the pod, some of the pods where when a new scaling happen okay so first of all part of the like benefit of the cron job is rather than doing like node by node it can start up like a bunch of nodes um, and you're specifically asking like at, when it's scaling down how we still have compute power So the answer is it doesn't. So it's it's basically like they're kind of working separately. So Carpenter is working like on the node level and then Kata is working on the like pod HPA level. So there's not gonna be nodes just sitting there unless there are nodes that are underutilized. Um, in general, because of the node consolidation and everything, we don't really have many nodes that are like at a high underutilization unless it's the HTTP ingress. So what that means is as it's increasing the replicas with Kata, it's like, okay, I need to do schedule this many more replicas. Carpenter sees, it's not interacting with Kata, it just sees that it needs to schedule more pods, and then it will spin up the nodes, which is part of the reason why this is like difficult to do with a BNA, because like like we would have to either like purposely create them. Go ahead. So let me rephrase. Yeah. Can can you tell Carpenter to keep that number of nodes Oh. when it's scaled down yeah yeah yeah. you can so you can say so you can either say like uh you can say keep them around for longer um you would have to have like a, a like different configuration for the provisioner so potentially like have a different provisioner specifically for this event which you can't overlap the provisioner so you can't have like a provisioner that would apply to where a pod could be like scheduled based on one or the other um and so we just and I just lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, so it's basically like we don't have extra ahead of time. It's just like they're there and then they're gone. And we would have to do extra work to keep them around. And in general, we don't really want to keep them around. It does, it's pretty smart about like, it's. you saw it took a little bit of time for it to scale back down. Um, but yeah, we have seen some errors on scale down because you can imagine like it's going like this and then going like that. And so it's a lot. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello, guys. I have a question. Like, is it okay to run cluster after scaling and Carpenter at the same time? No. Do you have to run only one tool? Correct. Um, so usually what you do is you scale down the cluster autoscaler to zero, and you do that after you have Carpenter set up. So you can't have the two together because they are both scaling the same thing in different ways, and so they don't, they explicitly says in the Carpenter mm -hmm. documentation to not have it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, have you had to make any changes to Cube Scheduler, or have you observed any weird interactions between Carpenter and Cube Scheduler? Because I can, I, I with Carpenter's bin packing and Cube Scheduler doing whatever the heck Cube Scheduler <laughs> does, uh, I can imagine that those are going to fight. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we haven't made any changes to Cube Scheduler. Um, some of the stuff that we've seen that's kind of weird is we had to like implement these interruption queues specifically because there was not like graceful termination of stuff, especially with like the daemon sets. And so it was essentially like sometimes weird things would happen where like it would struggle to like drain and delete the node or for some reason like something wasn't scheduled, wasn't at the right number of replicas. And so that's how we've gotten around it. But yeah, you're totally right. Um, so I think it's kind of like, Wonky stuff happens, but it's like it, the way it is right now, it's like, okay, the Carpenter can kind of like figure it out and fix it. As in like, say the cube scheduler like naively schedules something on a node and Carpenter's like, mm, I don't know, I want one node for all of that instead. Then it's able to like delete the node and then schedule things on that node. Cool, and thanks. you saw in the logs that it will show you like how many pods it's scheduling on the node. Thank you. Yep. Fantastic talk, thank you. Are you concerned about capacity limitations in the cloud? So you're moving from free scaling, from having an over-provisioner by the sounds of it, and you're now scaling on demand based on breaking news. As we enter the holiday periods, the clouds get busier. Are you concerned about running out of capacity when breaking news occurs and CUDA Carpenter can't scale anymore? I'm going to answer this very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think... In general, well, there are a couple things to consider. So first of all, like we are currently migrating more people to the clusters um, and the ingress, which means 
more scaling needed. Um, I would say holidays are not as big of a thing. It's really the election. And I would say the big one, first big one that's coming up is the Iowa caucus, which I think is in January. Um, so in general, what we do is we have um, a lot of stress testing and load testing. And in particular, this is like a separate thing, but we have an in-house uh, load testing set up specifically using K6, which allows people to like configure their load test and they can run stuff themselves, but there's a whole team that does elections readiness to make sure that we're like in a good situation for this. But yeah, you're totally right. That's brilliant. I would say it's a fantastic talk for the next KubeCon. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, with mixing up different instance sizes, how are you managing um, daemon set scaling, like uh, setting their resources? Is it just like statically to the largest instance size you run, or is there like any dynamic scaling there? So I think that. Yeah. So specifically, what it'll do is it, it doesn't consider like. Aside from knowing how much capacity it needs for the daemon sets, it doesn't consider that when it's spinning up new nodes. So it's just like what it knows, okay, I need like, maybe there are like seven daemon sets. So I need seven pods that are like this resource constraints that need to go on that node, but it will spin up the new node based on the other stuff that needs to get scheduled. Yeah, I'm asking like um, for larger nodes, you may need more daemon, more daemon set resources than uh, for smaller understand. nodes. You just provision like for the larger sizes. Yeah, times. so we, this is not ideal, but currently what we do is we've been shifting it. So basically, like, Carpenter doesn't do stuff exactly the same every time, but it seems to kind of pick similar instances. And so mm -hmm. what we've had to do over time as more stuff has migrated, as the, like, node size has increased, is we have to change those resource limits. And we've actually recently removed the CPU limit for the Datadog daemon set, specifically because of the way that like CPU starvation fails. It's like a silent fail compared to memory starvation. Um, and I think ideally, and I know we're doing this in the shared cluster we have in GKE, we want to just like completely remove mm -hmm. CPU. This is me speaking. I would like to completely remove CPU limits um, for <laughs> the deployments, all the deployments, tenants and everything, because there's been some gnarly stuff because of the CPU starvation. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, I was wondering, um, as you sort of migrating to this like really fast cluster auto scaling, how much did your application startup time uh, play into that? Like if you had a few applications that were really slow to start up, that were really like blocking it, would you see something where all of your applications would like, you know, be high CPU usage and then it would scale even more? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so part of the difficulty is like, we wanna live in a world with a shared platform where people don't have to worry about the infrastructure. That's not the world we live in. And honestly, like if you have a shared platform like that, congratulations, cause that, I don't know. Um, and so essentially what we've had to do is be really clear in our documentation. And then also when we see like outliers and advise people and basically be like, hey, so here naively is what Kubernetes is doing. Like pods can come and go, all of that. You don't know where they're gonna get scheduled. So you need to be more resilient. So we've had stuff happen in the past where tenants are like, having to change things, but usually because it's in one place, we look at it, we go help them, we talk to them, we get an understanding, and we've also done some of these migrations ourselves, like with the team. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's gonna shift. Cool, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. So the first one is uh, about the consolidation. So I see your node pool configuration. You set up the consolidate after 30 seconds. So have you ever seen um, the node that got the um, consolidation replaced to the small node, and in the next five minutes, it terminated the same node and spin up the uh, big sizer, and that created a, a lot of trigger, a lot of the uh, part get the rescheduling? Yeah, um, so that specific thing, maybe not, but like something similar, as in we've definitely seen situations where like, especially because of these like really fast short-lived spikes where nodes will start get started up and then it'll be like oh shit wait i need like i have now like five nodes it could be one node i'm going to consolidate them i would say it doesn't happen that fast and there's also the fact that like we're not doing node consolidation for the http ingress and so we don't have to worry about that happening with it and that is the main thing that has to scale just because of the scale with everything going through it uh, yeah, I guess because we, since we have a, a continuously delivery um, every minute, so we have a, like a 10K user running our platform. 
So that deployment is actually triggering the consolidations very frequently, and users try actually complain for that. Um, the other question is about your Spark instance. So how do you dealing with the Spark instance get recycled from the AWS? As in like when they're like recalled, you mean? Or they when they're recycled? They to no. recycle, to ask you, your Spark instance get back to the AWS pool. Yeah, um, so the answer is we, we just, the, the interruption queue has been important, the interruption queue I mentioned, mentioned before, but in general, I think we would have to do like significant more work to deal with that gracefully because we're not doing like the bidding and all of that. So in general, what will happen is it like gets recalled or whatever it's called, that node goes away and then it like gracefully terminates and then it's gonna like spit up new nodes to schedule this stuff. And to my knowledge, it's not gonna like deschedule the pods before it like spins up a new node, but I'm not 100% on that. Got it. Um, so um, regarding to the KDAT uh, component, um, this for, for the predictable use case for the breaking news. Mm -hmm. What about the unpredict unpredictable thing, news, like a earthquake, gunshot? Is that also possible to use the KDA to scale that? Yeah, so currently we're mainly using it for the predictable use case, but like the, sh the custom external push thing, trigger I was showing, that's what we're prototyping, and that would account for like, okay, a team tells us they're about to send out like a news notification, they know they're we're probably gonna get more traffic. That would, we would account for that. And then we, and other than that, we use, use KDA for like the normal CPU and metrics that you can do with HPA. So you rely on the, some external metrics to trigger that? Oh, not currently, we are prototype. That's like what we're okay. working on, but we, we will. Oh, sorry, last question. No, 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 no worries. Fine. Just to like walk back to what I said during the presentation. So the reason we're not doing it right now is because it's so little time, it's just not worth it. Like I think it's literally a couple seconds. And then also like we're one of the downstream services. And so it's like other stuff is doing things. Um, I know that like the team that sends out the push alerts have an, has an idea of audience that they're sending it out to. And that's really helpful. Um, but it's, it's basically like, eh, it hasn't been worth it. There are other things to work on, but we definitely want to do it. And honestly, ideally, we would probably talk to the folks sending out the push notifications or the ones requesting them and be like, we really need a heads up. Because I think historically, maybe like years ago, we got like 30 minutes. Now they're just like, whatever, a couple seconds. There you go. Cool, cool. <laughs> so, sorry, last question. No, oh, no these no are great questions. About the uh, uh, carpenter controller. So when I first deployed that, I actually uh, messed up a lot of configuration. It hand leading me to the terminate all of my uh, cube node. Yes, so, I remember when we migrated. <laughs> so have you had uh, any alert or how do you prevent that? Yeah, um, so we definitely have alerting. Didn't you set up some of the alerting for yeah, this? Yeah, we have, we have alerting and we also have multiple node groups. So we have, or node pool, sorry. No, node pool for the actual ingress controller, but we don't use spot instances because that's more, that's more resilient. And then we have like other node groups to manage tenant workloads. So I think that's also how we separate it. So yeah, they're based on the Carpenter uh, log or you based on the Carpenter controller matrix? The controller metrics. Matrix, okay. And we also, I don't remember the specifics of it, but there are like certain anomalies that we look for that we page on or at least post to like a Slack channel that we can look at. So it's like, ah, uh, you know, this, this node hasn't gone away. Like what's going on? Stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, not, it's not perfect. It's not ideal. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Carpenter is considering the node types in order to do the auto scaling. Is it also considering the region or the zone? Uh, so you, you have can do that. That was actually something I didn't talk about. This is a great question. Um, so in general, I'm pretty sure it balances stuff. There's a bit of weirdness in that, especially with these scaling events and that like, say we have, you know, US East 1A, B and C, right? The availability zones, it will balance them across. And I think this is something like in the configuration that we did. The problem is, is that if it's like, okay, we have 20 in one, 40 in one and 20 in the other, it's like, well, let's spin up 20 in the other two. But then if it like takes them down, then it's like, wait, we have to get rid of the other ones and then start up new ones. And then it's like this constant loop of like, wait, we don't have the right number. That was one of the weird behaviors we saw. So I'm trying to remember what we did for it. I think it just got into like a gnarly state at some point and we just had to fix it. Um, but I think part of it, that was for like the really, the like, regular predictable spike. And so we were able to kind of be like, okay, wait, I think there was some setting like with rebalancing so that it wasn't as naive about how it did it that we were able to use. Cool, thank you. Thank you. So with uh, the really short, discrete uh, traffic uh, 
spikes that you get. Have you, and I'm not really sure how like Amazon exactly like bills, like when it starts, when it ends, yeah. have y'all thought about integrating like Fargate, uh, which might have a faster like startup and shut down? I, I think initially we did consider Fargate, but we never actually used it in production. I think we might have done a POC, so I'm not sure. I think initially we might have, if you remember. If you if we've used Fargate to also solve a similar type of problem, uh, great talk. By the way, mm -hmm. it was one of the most valuable ones I think so far that I've I've been in because um, we use Carpenter. We we're just starting our journey with that. Yeah. Um, have you lived through any availability zone gray failures, and how does Carpenter handle that? When you say gray failures, can you be specific about what you mean? Yeah. When oh, you, start you mean like an availability zone goes where down it or just something? Can't okay. launch and ah. Um, I don't think we've had availability zone gray failures, or at least not to our knowledge. And now I'm like, we should set up an alert for that, because I would not be surprised if that's not happening. So maybe yeah, the, I should go do that the, now. The fun part of that with Amazon is you don't get an alert. You find yeah. out about right, it but later. I would set up an alert to like figure out their shenanigans, is what I'm saying. Like I'd have to look at it and see what's going on. But that's like a great point. Like I, I should go look at that so I can figure yeah. it out. What I would think you'd probably have to do is is tell Carpenter to not deal with the availability zone and do it manually, which is a problem. But I was just yeah. wondering if you've seen that before. Yeah, and for what it's worth, we, we do have like multi-region. So we have clusters in multiple regions. And as of recently, we have a cross-region service mesh. And the unified ingress is set up to fail over. So that's not exactly because if there's like one availability zone that's having problems, but if there's something like really wonky happening, it will just fail over to the other region. And so maybe then, but like, yeah, it's still not great. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk. Um, does Carpenter take into account compute savings plan if you have someone? <clears throat> That's a great question that I actually thought about today when I was uh, doing the talk. And I was like, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't have the time to look it up. I don't think it does, especially as someone who is like, waited around a lot in AWS Cost Explorer, which is confusing, very confusing when you do savings plans and spot instances and all of that. I don't think it does. Um, and then also part of the problem, and I know for sure it doesn't in the sense of if we tell it, hey, do these, like you can pick from these node types, it's not smart enough to be like, you have a savings plan for this specific node type, so I'm gonna make sure I use that node type. It's a little more naive, but that's, that's a great question. Can we maybe uh, tune the weights on the node types? to say that this is more preferable? I don't know. I want to say this is something that came up before and either like we couldn't do it or it was not like we, we couldn't figure out exactly how to do it because like mind you, Carpenter just graduated to beta. Um, so I'm not sure. Thank you. We got Thank one you more. everyone. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question. So <laughs> no worries. I know you guys were mentioning about scale up the by parts, right, or by nodes. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering what you guys to do with other resources like a DB or like a messaging system. How do you guys scale like those? Like database or? Yeah, like other resources, not only parts or nodes. As in like how do we scale, like say a database that's not running in the cluster that like an application is communicating with? Like I was thinking like uh, when you guys get a breaking news, right? Like not only requires a part level of yep. the resources, right? Yep. Maybe other resource dependent resources you guys may need. Yep. How you guys scale up those? Like So there is like the like built into the HPA, right? There's like the CPU and memory. But in terms of like the database, all that, I'm not sure. But I do know that for stuff that's outside of the cluster, which is usually like the more common thing, is that people are running like their main app in the cluster and maybe they're like communicating out to a database or something, that a lot of times they have to scale up ahead of time. There are like multiple other teams that are dealing with a similar problem. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to keep everyone here longer. <laughs> um, so in your demonstration, you kind of mentioned that you use the cron job part of Kita. However, I believe it does require that you give it like an actual number to scale up yep. to. So like, how Correct. did you derive that number? Do you use hysterical data? Um, I'm guessing this is for the regularly occurring spikes. Yep. So yeah. Yeah, we use historical data and it's like, obviously like, like slightly over provisioned. So it's like, 
historical data plus like 20%. But yeah, it's a set number of replicas that we scale our ingress controller up to. And to be clear, the number in the slide was not the number we do because I'm not going to put that in the slide. Yeah. Um, <laughs> kind of on the flip side, so when you have those sudden spikes, what do you actually use to determine the number of pods to scale up to? Is it a CPU memory like resource thing or is there an external metric because you were saying that previously you got like a 30 minute heads up but now you get a few seconds. Um, that's assuming that you have some sort of coordination between the breaking news alert versus like if there's an earthquake setting, you know, everyone's gonna check their phone and Google, you know, is there an earthquake near me? So how do you manage the sudden spikes rather than the regular spikes? So the answer is um, just hope for the, I mean, okay, that's a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, but we are like continuously trying to decrease the amount of time it takes to scale. So I think at this point we've, we've gotten like most of what we're gonna get out of it, but we're hoping this stuff improves over time. And I do really think that the main way that's gonna like help with this problem is either getting a heads up from the team that requests the push alert or uh, doing this external scaler in Kata that's like the custom scaler that uh, subscribes to the webhook. Because so. uh, they're really unpredictable and also you don't necessarily know what's gonna go out. I think the only thing that we have is like a Slack channel and then maybe you could get some idea. Um, but in general, like, if an election is coming up, we're like, oh, we're, we know we're gonna get more traffic. So we're probably gonna over-provision some because like, I'm sure for when the debate was happening, right? We probably saw a really big spike. I wasn't paying attention because I was on call and I was here, but yeah. And also the, the expected d traffic you were showing, that scale, that spike is much quicker. Like that's like a few seconds versus like 30 exactly. seconds a minute on the other one. So it's yeah, like we're able to scale for that. Yeah. yeah, just curious if like CPU or memory was an adequate signal to scale up in that rapid time period because you know you have pod startup and scheduling and all that good stuff. So just wondering, thank you Makes so much. Yeah. Thank you.